Greetings. Welcome to today. Uplasis Jeanette a Akwayakshi, a house at Aksuk Nutomapat. Welcome to Indigenous Insights. We're here at the Royal Ontario Museum for our bi weekly broadcast. And my name is Jeanette Akwayakshi. I'm the Indigenous Outreach and Learning Coordinator. What a treat to tune in today. And today we are with one of our Indigenous Knowledge Resource teachers, Jessie Jackman. Hello. Okay. Good morning. Nice to see everyone bright and early at the ROM. So my name is Jessie Jackamite and I'm one of the Indigenous Knowledge Resource Teachers here at the museum. And we'd like to take a moment to give thanks to the ancestral lands that we're on because the ROM's only been here for 105 years and we'd like to take the moment to acknowledge that the ancestral lands have been here since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, so uh, we're on the territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, who are part of the Anishinaabe Nation. Um, and Leslie McHugh often talks about like those words, like what does Anishinaabe mean, right? And the idea that it means people who live at the mouth of the river and how that river kind of comes out to go into the lake. Very nice. Yeah. We also acknowledge the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat. Thanks for tuning in. This is our bi-weekly broadcast. We tune in every second Thursday and we have a lovely team of Indigenous Knowledge Resource teachers. We have an opportunity to today to talk about different aspects of cedar, only that both Jesse and I are wild west coasters. I come from the New Channels ancestral lands on Vancouver Island. Yeah, and for myself, on my mother's side, I'm part of the Frog Clan through my mother's lineage, and I have Simshan and Gitscan ancestry. Fantastic. So today I was inspired when we were preparing for our broadcast that you talked about wanting to bring some ancestral objects from uh, sort of that West Coast lens. So let's start with what you had in mind. Yeah, so I have, um, this is kind of one of the main carving tools carvers would have used. This is an elbow aids or arch. So you find this tool actually all over the world. This is like a very um, common tool, but you find it on the Northwest Coast as well. So, um, I was talking to my cousin, my second cousin, Rupert Jeffrey Jr. because um, he's a carver, he still does lots of carving, and he was talking about how this was kind of like an everyday tool for doing all kinds of things. So for making um, canoes, for making longhouses, for carving totem poles, um, building houses, all kinds of things. This was kind of your jack of all trades tools, and it would have been used um, for totem poles as well. So I come from a long um, lineage of, of carvers. My great grandpa Jeffrey was a carver as well. Um, I was talking to my grandma Jeffrey last night and she said he was always carving while she was growing up. That was kind of one of his main things. And I remember that about him too, like his house smelled like cedar, you know, he was always carving. Um, and so you would use this tool when you were carving to kind of cut out those kind of main big shapes, right? And then once you kind of had your big shapes cut out, you would use smaller knives and other carving tools to kind of do those sure. finer details. As, as people are listening, keep in mind you're welcome to bounce us some questions. We'll do our best to answer. If not straight away, we'll do a little background and get back to you. But also just acknowledging, what can you tell us about totem poles? Where do they come from? Because we see them in every gift shop and you have a right. sample of yeah. a beautiful um, argillite. Yeah. Which is a very, very rare type of stone. Right, yeah. So this, this uh, stone right, comes from the Northwest Coast, um, and sometimes this stone would be used actually on, um, to make this part, the cutting, the cutting tool, would sometimes be made out of argillite. Um, but totem poles, yeah, what do, what do totem poles talk about? Um, they talk about the land, they talk about our family relationships, they talk about the animals on the land. Um, it's, it's really about like family relationships and, and rights to the, to the land and to the territory and, and about your crest, right? So I'm part of the frog clan um, through my mother's lineage. So like the frog is one of the crests that I would use. My great grandpa Jeffrey, like he had different crests that he would use as well. The raven, the bear, he was a chief of many nations. So he had different crests that he would use um, in his total book. In some respect, it was a family billboard. It was information mm -hmm. about your relationships, your yeah. responsibilities in community. And what's really important, I think, for viewers to know is that totem poles only exist in one part of the country. We're not all one good looking group of indigenous people, I like to say. We yeah. represent three different oceans. We come from the west coast of Vancouver Island, so we're on the, on the shores of the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. So I think it's really vital for, for uh, Canadians at large, and especially the tourist industry, to catch on that totem poles aren't a one size fits all indigenous icon. They right. come from one place in the country, and that's where there's big trees. Yeah, it's true. I remember when I first 
first came to Ontario, I thought the trees were really small <laughs> up here. For um, sure. We're lucky on the northwest coast. We live in a rainforest. We get beautiful big trees, and we have um, so many amazing resources that our ancestors used and and thrived on living off the land. For certain. So you brought another another piece of of of. Um material to show yeah. us like, to your aunts. Um, okay, so like I was saying, I was talking to my, my cousin, Rupert uh, Jeffrey Jr., and he was talking about how um, this part was sometimes made out of um, jade. So this is jade. So sometimes the cutting tool would be jade. Sometimes it would be this material, argillite, this kind of black stone. Um, but we also had steel for a long time. So I mean, um, it's likely we were probably trading for a long time with other people because we had steel for a really long time as well to, to use for our, our, um, for our tools. What I love is that indigenous cultures haven't remained static, that we are living cultures, we continue to practice our craft, and there's even carvers I know who use chainsaws to mm -hmm. cut out the bits yeah. and chunks and get the story started. And I know the elders that I work with are very passionate about making sure that we use our, do our artwork in modern ways, that we're not just yes. freeze framed in the past. Of course. And Dr. Duke Redbird would say, it's not our job to retrofit our culture to make it, you know, so we don't mm -hmm. have to look all stoic and, and right. you know, like we're, yeah. we're just fresh off a, you know, fresh off a, a, a postage stamp of mm -hmm. a, an indigenous stereotype. Because we have right. short hair, we have long hair, you know, yeah, we, we come in all shapes and sizes. Definitely. So. We've been traveling a, a long, long time and getting new knowledge and materials and ideas for for thousands and thousands of years. So why would we why would we stop doing that now and try to pretend like we have to stay in the past. Stay in the past and still make paint using berries and, and fish exactly. grease. Oh you know, we can go to the store and buy some paint. <laughs> and you brought cedar. What inspired you to bring this piece of cedar today? Uh, well, we were just talking about cedar and kind of like thinking about um, that material and how important it was to people on the Northwest Coast. Um, I was reading Hilary Stewart's book, um, Cedar, Tree of Life, and she kind of talks about how, um, you know, from cradle to grave, it was like kind of all about cedar. You'd be born onto a cedar mat and then you'd be buried in a cedar box, right? So it was like kind of this really key um, material that we were we were using constantly, right? To, to weave and to make clothing, to make houses, canoes, art, you know, so many things come from this this beautiful this beautiful tree. And we know that old growth forest, which is becoming sadly more and more rare, yeah. you could it could take up to like if we held hands, it could take eight, Ten. six, yeah, eight nice. adults oh, to, to stand and hug one tree. Huge. So what stands out for me about this, if I could jump in, mm -hmm. is that I'm a cedar bark weaver. And this is the outer bark yeah. of the cedar, and this would be the inner bark. So when I would go weaving or har harvesting, some folks say cedar bark stripping, I prefer harvesting. So I harvest, and we only harvest this time of year. And I was back home in BC this time last year, and I was able to get a little bit... And the other part of it is that, um, like in most indigenous people, we're land-based mm -hmm. uh, cultures, so we listen to the rhythm of the, of the season and we pay attention. So if we harvest past June, this new layer that's growing will get sticky oh. because I guess it's trying, that new growth is trying to stick to the tree. So we can't harvest it after June or, or, oh. or, or it'll be full of pitch. So what we do is we harvest it May, June, and then I learned something interesting last year that when skunk cabbages al alive or like blossom for the year, mm -hmm. that's a sign that cedar is ready to harvest. Mm -hmm. And part of that is knowing your environment, right? So that's very exciting. So we would uh, usually, we use modern tools now. We'll take, some folks have these elaborate like uh, machetes. Mm -hmm. I don't know where to get a machete myself, but some folks <laughs> have a machete. And yeah. some people will use a basic ax, but we'll, we'll Firstly, give thanks to the tree yeah. and thank the tree. And one granny said to the forest before we went in, she spoke in our language, uh, late Geraldine Tom, and she said to the forest, and she translated for me, we're only here for what we need. We're not here to do any harm. And once we have what we need, we'll be gone. And once we were in the forest, it started to rain. And she said, oh, don't tell my mom. And I'm just thinking, this 62-year-old woman was still afraid of her mother, right? <laughs> and, and I'm just thinking, I might not ever meet her mother. I'm here yeah. for a quick visit and a Canada Council grant. But it was the first time after we left when it started to rain in the rainforest, we left and I didn't get et by mosquitoes. So I was, I think, 
that was a hard won lesson that all the years before I had harvested and then got like it gave a blood donation to the mosquitoes. <laughs> but this time around we didn't get et because we left when it started to rain. So right. I'll always keep that in mind. And more recently, um, I believe it's Tom uh, Happy Note was telling me that we harvest, his granny said, harvest on the east side of the tree mm -hmm. so that the morning sun will help the tree heal. Oh, that's so smart. Which I thought was very, very kind hearted. Yeah. I've had granny yeah. say harvest where there's least amount of branches, right? Like, so it depends yeah. who you're learning from. Okay, right. But we would score this, we would get the, get the like, use um, a, a contemporary tool more, more than this, and we would score mm -hmm. the edge and then score it a little bit up the side and then we would pull oh. it. And then we would take the time to leave this outer bark and we would only take the inner bark, which is what we see here. So this is the inner bark. And if we were to unfurl it, that's to show you how tall this tree was. Not to say that we actually went to the, the height of this tree, like the tree gives us what it gives us, right? We're, we just take what, they, what the tree generously gives us. But then I would soak this in hot water because I don't want to get cramps in my hands. So that was another tip from oh. the grannies. So always keep your water hot so uh, it doesn't get, um, get cramps. And then, you know, a customary, like a very traditional um, headband would be this one for me. And for men, it might be thicker. Okay. And then you'll see along the West Coast, some have fur, some have yep. buttons in the middle. People go, go different. So I'm just showing some of the more, more traditional pieces. This is a hat that Geraldine, um, Edgar, Tom helped me make. She's from the Ditty Dot First Station, and this was generous from a Canada Council grant. And it has a headband like this one on the inside to help it fit on my head. So this is, um, um, I often have um, people who are Chinese say it looks like their design. Yeah. And what we can agree on is we're both coastal folk Mm -hmm. around a lot of rain so we want the rain to go away from us yeah. and then a more uh, um, as I mentioned the grannies where I come from say use this in modern ways yeah. so I made a, a Victorian outfit and the only thing it was missing was a top hat so I made this top hat as part of a Canada Council grant um, and it's part of a long journey for me to become Ooh. a milliner because I'd like to to tell stories oh. with hats because I'm already a textile artist but to do a fusion of that and I was saying to the the ladies on the way in one of the things that I also brought was a piece of white ash mm -hmm. which is from this region and if you ever if you ever want to see an amazing um, harvest of this um, I've seen it only ever harvested on a on a YouTube video Okay. But the YouTube yeah. video you can look up on white ash harvest, they take a, a, a fallen log, mm -hmm. they clean off all the bark, they score it, kind of like I was saying, like um, on an edge like this and on an edge like this, mm -hmm. and then I think they use a rubber mallet, but they bang it, and then the tree generously gives off strips, like the tree is so oh. generous. So what I'd like to do is actually soak this cedar bark hat in hot water again, and clean up the weave, because I was in a bit of a hurry when I wove it, mm -hmm. and make the weave tighter. And where it's missing spots, yeah. I'd like to do a fusion of oh, the white ash as a way to cool. sort of show, showcase that I'm a West Coaster living in this homeland yeah, now. I like and then that. another example are belts. I got a Canada Council grant as well to do belts. And one of the yummy things I found out is that if cedar bark is wet, and it's gonna be much thinner than this because yeah. I have to thin it out to ribbon thin. I can sew it with a sewing machine. Oh. But it has to be wet. That's so that was a really lovely discovery that I could... Uh, so I, you sew right over it while it's wet? While it's wet. Okay. And that was really encouraging. And this one was fun. It gets a little weathered because when I sit, it's at my tummy and when I touch the back of the chair, but it makes a statement. Yeah, mm -hmm. it reminds me of the, um, like the skirts that have kind of this like cedar fringed and mm -hmm. um, yes. yeah, yeah. And then today I also wore a cedar bark um, mm -hmm. uh, collar on my outfit just for kicks. I made this yeah. when I went to Argentina because oh. uh, it has Argentina colors on it, which is yeah, kind of fun. Really uh, fun. But I was invited to present down there uh, as a textile artist. This is really itty bitty little, but it is a little cedar bark rose that is made into the life.
pigeonholed in the past. We're not a black and white photo. We're technicolor. We're bright. <laughs> we're alive, and we're yeah. we're celebrating our West Coast culture today. What a treat to to share this time with you today. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Uh, How, we've got a, an event coming up on Friday. Tell us a bit more about yeah. that. So tomorrow I'm doing a workshop called Deconstructing um, Rays, and we're going to be talking about. Yeah, just colorism, racism, the residential school system, but also kind of talking about that idea, like, are we actually in categories of, like, black and white and brown? Like, actually, all of our skin tone is brown. If we're talking about color theory as an artist, yes. we're all different shades of brown, right? And so the idea that we put each other into these categories um, for power, really, and control. When I think deconstructing race is also a conversation about being in agreement that we're all from the same human race. Yes. That we're all yeah. of the same species, that we share this life-giving mm -hmm. planet. And it'll be a high school, yeah. uh, high school classes that yes. we'll be engaging with, Ooh. which is a, a little stretch from working with it's little ones. It's true, yeah. So I, my, my comfort zone is definitely the little kids, the primary and junior school kids. But I'm, I'm excited to talk to high school students and get into some deeper discussions with them. Lovely. And, and uh, yeah, yes. hopefully we can learn together. So that's one of our, our last Indigenous special events for this school year, and I know that our team will be doing a debrief and getting ready to, to gear up and plan for next year. But do keep in mind that the Indigenous Learning Department does have a commitment to Indigenous education and digital learning as our strategic priorities, and therefore we end up having really wonderful Indigenous special events like uh, the one that Jesse just described that are often led either by community facilitators, Indigenous community facilitators, or our own Indigenous knowledge resource teachers. So keep that in mind as you think about planning for uh, your next school year that you can always lean on the Royal Ontario Museum and see what type of Indigenous activities we have. And we decided not to celebrate just once or twice a year. We celebrate Indigenous culture year round because Indigenous peoples deserve more than just one day or one month. Uh, we're the original people of the land, so it's nice to hear about our living cultures. And I think it's always a wonderful opportunity as we wrap up another another episode of Indigenous Insights is to remind you we'll be back in two weeks, 9.40 in the morning. So we're looking forward to finding a rhythm and routine with everybody out there. So I hope you tune in. And in the meantime, there's a couple ways you can get to the ROM for free. Every third Monday night, they just launched that. Every third Monday night of the month, it's free from 5.30 to 8.30, I believe. So that's one way that the community can tune in. And the other is the Indigenous uh, the, the First Peoples Gallery, the Daphne Cockwell Gallery dedicated to First Peoples art and culture is free to the public year round. So if you want to visit Indigenous ancestral objects we have in our beautiful collection here at the Royal Ontario Museum, we have good looking Indigenous knowledge resource teachers like Jesse and the rest of our team that will be there between 10 and 2 Monday to Friday. So visit anytime, visit often, meet more than one of the teachers because they'll bring the, the gallery to life in many different ways. Ushakshi Kleitz. Thank you for coming to uh, tuning in today, and we look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Thanks again. Bye. Bye-bye.